Hi everybody and welcome to Slate Peak in the North Cascades. This is my first time, kind of embarrassed to say that, but I'm up here on a beautiful Tuesday. It's high noon and I'm not by myself. In Wenatchee I picked up USGS geologist Ralph Agarud and it's a rare treat to learn from somebody like Ralph who has lots of experience mapping up here and pretty much every other place as far as I can tell. Ralph is the co-author of Geology of North Cascades. Let's learn from Ralph. Thank you for joining us here at Slate Peak. Well, I can't thank you enough. This has already been a delight just chatting with you all the way up here, Ralph. Thank uh, you for the ride and for the conversation. It's nice to be back home. And this is home for you. You warned this me that as soon as we got you up here, it'd be hard to get you back in the rig. Well, when's the last time you were up here? I think it was about 15 years ago. Okay. And you were up here regularly mapping how long ago? We back in the early 90s, maybe? Yeah, 30 years ago. Okay, good. Well, we're just going to film as we go. And uh, we just got out of the car. We parked old Whitey down here at the, uh, uh, as far as we could drive up Slate Peak off the top of your head. What's our elevation here? We're about 7,200 feet. 7,200 feet elevation. That's as high as you can go in Washington? I think this is the highest road you can drive in Washington State. I believe it. So we're eventually going to head up to that lookout, I think, but the geology comes spladam right in front of you. And so if you want to drive all the way up, I'll put a GPS location for our parking spot here at Slate Peak. And this is just a few steps from the parking lot and it gets good in a hurry. So yeah, let's uh, what unit are we in here? What rough age are we? And what's the attraction for this outcrop here? We are in the Slate Peak member uh -huh. of, the, of the Virginian Ridge Formation okay. of mid-Cretaceous age, probably Cenomanian, although that's not definite. Um, Cenomanian is about 95 million years ago. Thank you for that. And we stopped here because the rock has holes in it. And if you come over here and look closely, you can see all of these little spots where something has dissolved out of the rock. Okay. And this is a mudstone. And in some places you can see the holes are, are rounded or concentric. And I've got a piece I picked up earlier hiding under your hand. Mm -hmm. Shows this better. Here's a, a cast of the beast that's making these holes. And here is a cross section through it. Oh my Lord. And these are Actianella. They're a thin-bedded spiral snail. <laughs> At 7,200 feet or whatever you just said. Yeah. Okay. And um, to cut to the chase, yep. uh, this is one of the two places where rocks that have been called Virginian Ridge have marine fossils in them. Marine. And these are an anomaly in the Virginian Ridge. Most of the Virginian Ridge is clearly not marine. It's a fluvial deposit. But here we're apparently shallow marine. Um, when I was working up here, I was aware of this fossil locality and also aware that fossils can tell us how warm the water was and therefore what latitude they were deposited at. Mm -hmm. And I asked to have some of the Burke Museum's collection of these shells sent to the expert on Actianellas. And I asked him, can we tell from this how old they are and what latitude were they deposited at? And he wrote back, well, yes, these are brackish water snails. Okay. And if you tell me how old they are, I can give you the latitude or if you know the latitude, I can tell you what, how old they are, but I can't do both at the same time. And oh. we don't know the age precisely enough to get a paleo latitude, <laughs> nor the paleo latitude will have to say what the age is. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> so the, these are mid Cretaceous or, or earliest late Cretaceous, uh -huh. brackish water shells. The, the very, very thin shells, this beautiful, delicate structure, are telling you that there, there's no wave energy here. So we're in very protected waters. Uh -huh. um, and apparently they were shallow water. I guess we know that from the biology. I don't know that from the shells. Right. Um, and they're an anomaly in the otherwise freshwater Virginia Ridge Formation. These aren't ammonites, are they? Or are no, they? no. Th th these are snails. Okay. So yes, they're, they're mollusks, but they're a, not a mollusk with a head and, and tentacles. Um, they're, they're a mollusk with a, a foot that crawls over through the mud and eat things that way. So if somebody could come up with a really precise date from this part of the strat column, there could be a way to 
Potentially. Out the poten That's my memory of what I was told. And yeah. unfortunately, I've even forgotten the name of the paleontologist that I was in correspondence with about this. Okay. And they're just in the black stuff. They're not in this. What's, what's the, the weathered stuff? Ah, uh, okay. This gets challenging. Got a um, hammer if you need it. Uh, okay. This is, is a sandstone because it's got a shale chip in it. Okay. Um, these rocks here around in the metal block around Slate Beacon Hearts Pass mm -hmm. are full of sills of granite diorite and tonalite oh. that look just like a sandstone. Sure and the does. Sandstones are lightly, lightly metamorphosed and stuck together, and they're very hard to tell from granite diorite or oh. tonalite. And so the, the USGS geologists who worked in here in the 60s doing a mineral resource evaluation in the wilderness had a hard time telling sandstone from pluton sometimes. Um, but this, there's a shale chip, this is a sandstone. What's the shale chip? Uh, I'm sorry. There's, there's a, little, a little, little black piece here. Got it. There's a black piece here. Um, I'm not seeing any better ones. And so it can't be a pluton. You can't see be a pluton, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so this is a sand layer. The Virginian Ridge Formation is, this is Virginian Ridge. I'm facing south right now. Yeah. Virginian Ridge was deposited, sourced from the west. We're eroding away the Hosamine Group, which is a chert and greenstone terrain, and making lots of, of chert sand and the greenstone weathers to mud. It's being carried from the west and interfingers with and is overlain by Winthrop Formation, which is mostly sandstone weathered from granitic rocks east of the Pesatan Fault, we think. Huh. And, and the sands in here, we're essentially at the base of the axis right now. They're inner finger, and, they, and this sand probably has both chert and granitic detritus in it. That's what it looked like to me. But all marine, or we could have some terrestrial stuff coming into a shallow marine scene here. Well, the shells are telling us it's marine. Right. And the um, regional setting are telling us that it's mostly terrestrial, because most places where we see rocks that look like this, they have mm. leaves, they have sticks, mm -hmm. and they have in situ stumps in them. Okay. And the bedding style, um, the, the, uh, the cross bedding in the sands, the cross bedding in the gravels, yeah. uh, the, uh, the way the rocks are put together are also saying for the most part that they're terrestrial, they're river deposits. But in this place where we are right here, which is at the basin axis, right in the middle where they inner finger, right. um, and towards the top of the section, I think, um, there's an area in here where the bedding is a little different and we find these fossil shells. And I think we're now in sort of shallow, a shallow marine setting, tidal waters. And in my mind, what I think about is the Santa Clara Valley, the south end of San Francisco Bay. Oh, interesting. Where, where the San Francisco Peninsula, Santa Cruz Mountains to the west, yeah. shedding debris to the east, oh. and the Diablo Range to the east, shedding debris to the west. Uh -huh. And they interfinger to a valley, the Santa Clara, which as you go north becomes shallow marine, south end of San Francisco Interesting. Bay. Interesting. And I think of a setting like that for this. Sure. Well, I mean, I think even I would notice these fossils. Right? I think my eye would be drawn to this somehow. Oh my God. Well, they're striking. And so the first workers in here thought that the Virginia, and the second round of workers thought that the Virginia Ridge was marine because it has these fossils in it. Right. But after many, many days of walking through these rocks looking for more fossils, I will tell you, that these outcrops of this bed are an anomaly. <laughs> Most of the Virginian Ridge does not have shells, snail shells in it. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> and I, I wish we could walk up to the places where you could stick your head into a, the cast of a, a tree stump. Oh God! It's right been overrun here. by a chert gravel. Right here. It's like jawbreakers in cross section. Yeah. But and then here's here's a snail. Here's a snail. Here's a snail. Here's a snail, here's a snail, here's a snail. Has to be a lower latitude. <laughs> no, <laughs> could be, but we don't uh, know. Oh, we got our new friend interested yeah. now, nice. Is that a mollusk? Yeah, a, that's a snail shell. A snail shell? Yeah. Like a, a marine snail yeah. or a freshwater? We, th we think they're brackish water. Now, where's that sample I had? Yeah, here it is. How old is this material? Here's one in cross section, and here's the outside of one. Oh. It's so different when you know what you're looking at. Otherwise, yeah. I would just think those were blobs. So plus or minus um, five or eight million years, this is 95 million years old. 
Um, maybe a hundred, maybe ninety-three. And a hundred million is a tenth of a billion. Is that right? Yeah. Hundred million is pretty old. Hundred million is the middle of the Cretaceous. We're we're in the middle of the last of the three chapters of dinosaurs. And when was this material laid? I mean, uh, so the, where was this material when it was laid down? <laughs> You've been listening to us. We'd love to know. Oh. <laughs> Um, there are some geologists who think that this stuff has been, you know, directly west of Spokane since 100 million years ago. Other geologists think 100 million years ago this stuff was in Nicaragua. Oh, really? And and we'd like to know. We'd like to resolve the is answer. This marine sediment, or it's it's a shallow marine brackish oh, water. Oh, this. How is how does that much fine material settle out that quickly? What what <sighs> event causes a bunch of silt to silt that thick that quickly to cover all these things. you're asking very good questions how much geology how many geology courses have you oh, taken <laughs> I'm a, well I, i'm a biologist okay a these, curious person. these are great questions um probably i think if we could take this rock apart in fact actually i can see enough here to it this is actually a mixture of sand sized and silt sized and clay sized materials and this sort of thick homogeneous black goop is a sign that the sediment has been stirred up and oh. we're not seeing the original depositional fabric. And oh yeah, you're, you're, I'm not they're, they're seeing little, the they're, layers. They're, they're, they're little speckles of coarser grains in here. Oh. And so this is sand and clay and silt, which tells you either it was deposited as a slurry, or it was deposited in many events. A, a sand, you know, a bigger current that lays some sand down a, a still period where the clay settles out, and it's been mixed since then. And those snails probably didn't live in that crowded a fashion. Oh, I see. So we're probably looking at um, basically an accumulation of dead snail shells that's been churned by other beasts or by themselves burrowing through the mud. And, and the, the thick blackness of it are perturbation. So you could have this material deposit very, very gradually mm -hmm. and accumulate a huge amount and then have these organisms burrow in there and mix it up and mix it up and then the hole gets compressed or whatever yeah, happens yeah gets yeah, covered with yeah. or something yeah wow, and and, and and so that's taking a long time but here we have an episode of current lay putting in a sand layer now we have you know a hundred or a thousand years of quiet time and we deposit mud and there's another sand layer Oh, I see. So there's well, you're dealing with millions of years. There's, there's a little bit more energy involved in delivering these particles than there than in delivering. In, yeah. In the spider yeah. material. Yeah. Because it, it really doesn't look like. I mean, I can buy that there's sand in there, but there isn't a lot. This looks like pretty pretty fine material. Well, and if this weren't so thoroughly compressed and lithified. Um, what I got taught to do as an undergraduate is to chew on some of it to find out how much sand there is in there. Oh, yeah, and if there's a grit? You, you find out. Because yeah. you, you can't look at these rocks and see if there's sand in them or not. Or or if it's... Well, actually, the test for chewing is silt versus clay. You look oh. at it and say it's all clay, but if you chew on it, you find out it's not. Okay, viewers, we're doing you a favor. We're not recording while we're huffing and puffing. We're, st we're stopping and taking a quick break and taking advantage of the good light on this outcrop. Uh... Why did we stop here, Ralph? We stopped here because this is a sand bed overlying mud, mm -hmm. or maybe it's overlying mud. Okay. The rocks are clearly not horizontal. Right now their attitude is about like this. Thank you. And we know from, from theory that rocks like this are always deposited with the layers flat. Yeah. And now they're not flat. And I consider myself a structural geologist, and I'm interested in how they got folded so they aren't flat anymore. And part of that is trying to recognize every place I see layered rocks. Are they right side up? Or are they upside down? Mm -hmm. And the bases, or what I think is the base of a sand bed, is a good place to look for that. And here, well, in many rocks where you deposit a sheet of sand over a layer of mud, the sand is denser and it'll sink down into the mud. And as it sinks, it develops a wavy, irregular base. And here I see a hint of the, the base climbing up this surface. I see a hint of irregularity in here. Wow. And my suspicion is that this is upright, that the top younging is that direction. Mm -hmm. I'm not positive of that, so I'm not making a note here that says this is upright, because if you were to come back and say this other evidence says it's upside down, I'd believe you if the evidence is good enough. 
But would it not be wavy if it was upside down? What's the waviness? The waviness then could be um, happenstance of how the rock broke. Uh -huh. It could be um, the younger deformation these rocks have been through, the places we've stopped we didn't film back there where there might have been a fault. Yeah. Um, I mean, these, these rocks have some history. Uh -huh. And there are other ways they could have a, a wavy bed surface. And when you were mapping out here a generation ago, you weren't at this scale normally, were you? You weren't like picking through this with a fine tooth comb. You had to cover some ground. We had to cover some ground, but that meant stopping every now and then. Yeah. And, and mostly waiting two thens and then a now. <laughs> and, and when you get to the outcrop, you do look closely, yeah. but you may skip two or three before you stop again. Right. Um, because we were trying to cover 32 seven and a half minute quadrangles with two geologists in four summers. <laughs> and at that point, you can't afford to look at everything. Um, especially when you're getting from the one outcrop to the next on foot, not driving, not helicoptering. Right. It, it's a slow process. Now, and, is this the slate of Slate Peak? I mean, we're at Slate Peak. Is this clay? Is this mud? Is this shale? It truly is slate? Well, it's not very good slate. Okay. I mean, the, you, you couldn't roof your cabin with this stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's dark enough and splintery enough and fine-grained enough that somebody thought to call this mountain Slate Peak. Good enough. And, and so, and it's the type of locality for this flavor of Virginian Ridge formation. So this is a Slate Peak member. And why is this road here? Was this a prospecting thing originally to go look at this slate for economic reasons? My understanding of the history is the road we drove up to was first built to get to a gold mine that's over that ridge and gold mines that are down in the next valley. Okay. And that history is pre-World War II. And there was a fire lookout put up on this mountaintop sometime in the middle of last century. Mm -hmm. or earlier, I don't know when. Mm -hmm. And it probably had access via a horse trail. Oh, I see. Because it's hard to build a lookout without at least a pack train to bring yeah. pieces in. Yeah. And then the nice sign back at the parking lot explained that in the 60s, this mountaintop got leveled to build part of a, uh, an air raid defense system to keep the Russians away. And at that point, there was a road built up here and the mountaintop got leveled. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll just keep it rolling. There, there's something here. The edge of the past. So this is where we can Let's take see. off to go down the West Fork of the Pasayan River. Okay. I don't think we're going to do today. Oh, why not? You want to just go bust down there quick, come back? <laughs> well, I've been there and done that, but <laughs> it's tempting. I'm sure you have. It's tempting. Oh, we're at the boundary of the Pasayan Wilderness. Yeah. And how much of your work was done within the Pasayan Wilderness? Um, was it a wilderness when you were working? There? It was wilderness. Uh -huh. um, I should say Roland was in here. Roland Tabor. Roland Tabor in the early, in the mid 60s, um, when this was North Cascades primitive area. Mm and helped to do a mineral resource evaluation that was part and parcel of the process of splitting the primitive area into North Cascades National Park and the Pasadena Wilderness. Okay. And they wanted to make, Congress wanted to make sure we weren't locking up too much gold or molybdenum or whatever, yeah. the process of doing that. Yeah. But when I came in here, this was all wilderness, which means that our work in the backcountry was mostly done with a pack string for support. No kidding. No helicopters and obviously no roads. So not to obsess about that, but you're, you're truly hiring a guy who's got mules or whatever, that whole thing? Is that what we're talking we about? We hired an outfitter who had mules, yeah. And, and he carried our camp from place to place, and we walked so we could see the rocks in between. <laughs> and it turned out that the really the very best part of the whole process was that the packers did the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> Although, that, not quite the whole story, um, they would get very upset when Roland would step in and say, no, no, I want to wash the dishes. Because <laughs> we'd spend our day crawling across... Oh, God. Hillsides covered with evergreens and come back with hands that were all pitchy, and that was one way to get your hands warm and get the pitch off was to wash the dishes. So if you're looking out that way, you're looking at a beautiful landslide there, just over Robinson Pass. I don't know how we point at things on the screen, but there's a, a big arc with a tail of slope in the middle. Okay, yeah. And that's a nice deep-seated landslide with the whole mountainside is falling down into Robinson Creek. And Robinson Pass there is actually two passes, a West Robinson and an East Robinson. Huh. And the nice thing is that both of them are rounded. 
a clear sign of the continental ice sheet riding over the top. Oh my God, if, 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 the, if the bedrock isn't complicated enough, we're throwing in not only alpine ice, but continental ice. Yeah. And burying everything? Well, one of the joys of working out here is you look at this landscape and there are these big U-shaped valleys. A lot of the valleys have steep sides and steep headwalls for cirques to say, oh, alpine glaciation. Alpine, alpine, yeah. And then you get up on the ridge crest, and we don't have any right here. They've been carried away if there were any. Sure. But on those ridge crests or that ridge crest out there, and you find blocks of the, of the tonalite from, from Pesaten Peak, which is up there, the pyramid against the near bank of smoke, uh -huh. which is a, a 90 million year old pluton that cuts across everything. And, and there's, you can do the bedrock mapping. There's no tonal light right here. And so to find those blocks in the ridge crest, they must have been brought here by ice. Big boulders of granite essentially perched on top of some of these ridges. Perched on top of these sandstone and mudstone ridges. And, and you've mapped and known the nearest granite is five or 10 miles to the north. And it's clear evidence that ice has overridden everything. And it can't be alpine ice. It can't be alpine ice because alpine ice doesn't go over the ridge crests. And so there's a history that's cryptic of alpine glaciation to shape the landscape. And then ice sheet glaciation coming from the north overriding everything. My God. And I forget how high up we've seen ice evidence, but I know we've seen it at least up to about 7,400 feet. Where we are, basically. Yeah, and so we should, you know, walk down the ridge see if we can find erratics or find yeah. scratches on yeah. the ridges. Huh. Interesting. Um, I hope I'm not. You're fine, thanks. Yeah, I appreciate What was your name again? Bill Cantrell. Bill, it's nice to meet you, Bill. Thanks for joining yeah, us here. Thank you guys. This is very interesting. <laughs> So before we lose the sight of a couple of these ridges, do you have personal history on some of these ridges that we can see, Ralph? Well, I've walked this one and I've walked this one and I didn't walk that one. I have not been up Robinson Mountain. I haven't been at Monument Peak. I haven't been up Osceola. I've been on most of the ridge crest from Osceola to Robinson Pass. Um, I can tell you that Osceola is wonderful. If we could be five miles that way and over the ridge and look back, we could see that the top of Osceola is Winthrop Formation on top of a thin skim of Virginian Ridge on top of Hearts Pass. Mm. And beneath it, you can draw a line. Underneath that is Ventura Redbeds of the Goat Wall Formation, and then Winthrop and Virginian Ridge and Hearts Pass. And at Osceola, you're clearly at the south end of the Chihuahuan Thrust, which is the big thrust in the Methow mm. that's moved things I don't know, 10 kilometers or more from the west to the east, stacking older rocks on top of younger rocks. All in the vintage of mid-Cretaceous, not all only of, the rocks, but the, the folding and thrusting. Yeah. All of those rocks I mentioned, the Hearts Pass, the Virginian Ridge, the Winthrop, the Goat Wall, um, span an age range of probably about 105 or 108 million years to maybe 90 million years. Mm. And the thrusting is probably older than the 88 million year old, 87 million year old Fawn Peak stock, or the roughly same age Pesaten dike. It's, it's not a dike, but it's a big elongate narrow pluton that cuts across things. And so the name of it is the Pesaten dike. Mm. And before I turn the camera off, while we huff and puff another stretch, looks like more of the quote unquote slate yep. down by the road, and then more of the sandstone, and maybe a pluton cutting everything. Uh, Maybe plutonic rock. Uh, there, the this mid Cretaceous set of sediments in the Metau, and much of the Metau block is threaded through with sills oh. of, of fine grained granite diorite or tonalite, and it helps hold up any of the peaks. And it gets very hard sometimes to tell an intrusive rock from a sandstone. So they're both quartz feldspar biotite, and they're both well cemented, and they both have fairly even grain size. And you've got to go look for the shale chips that show it's a sandstone. Yeah. Or um, the beautiful angular biotite well preserved that suggests it's not been carried by water and rounded at all, but it's a pluton. And the plutons, dikes, and sills can be both mid Cretaceous and Eocene? There's both generations of this igneous activity up through here? Both generations. We think that the, the gray ones that are parallel layering are mostly mid Cretaceous. Okay. We don't have any many numbers to justify that, mm -hmm. but they, they look like the the big bodies, the big plutons that we do have dates on that are mid Cretaceous. The cream-colored 
dikes and also basaltic dark dikes that cut across the layering um, look a whole lot like the cream portals, like the Golden Horn Bath Lift sure. or the Monument Peak stock over here, which we have numbers on and are, they're ESC 50 million years old. Suddenly we're 50 million years So we think the dikes younger. are that yeah. age yeah. also. Yeah. And so, for example, Dead Horse Point, where we drove around, is, is there because there are a whole lot of these big cream colored dikes that are closely spaced together that are stronger than the enclosing mudstone and sandstone and holds up a steep place. And they're the Eocene dikes. Well, just personally, it, it's kind of fun to be at one particular spot like this and be able to tie much of the bedrock geology to these two major chapters that I continue to try to think about, the Insular chapter and then the Silesia chapter. And those are the two main narratives, it seems like. Yeah. At first glance, it looks chaotic and it's, oh my God, there's all these individual things. But those are the two broad generations of major action well yes i mean th there are more stories there's an older story there are jurassic rocks underneath here we see yeah. some pieces of up in manning park and down around twist yeah but we don't see much of it i can't tell you any story about those mm -hmm. they they were there were formed on top of something else that i don't know about at all huh. and if we only knew how to look at it there's probably a cascade arc story in this landscape somewhere but i don't know what it is whoa you know where, <laughs> where, where 25 million years ago was the land surface here? Yeah. And we know it was above our heads. Yeah. Um, but if we go to the border on the west side of Ross Lake, we can find pieces of that surface underneath the Skagit Volcanics or the Volcanics of Mount Rom. Okay, hang on. Now, now, now you got me thinking. Hang on just a sec, Ralph. Come on. Uh, how much... So the, the far jagged peaks is the crystalline core. Yeah, the ones you can barely see that have snow on them out there, out there, and Ruby Mountain, which we can see, but it's very gray in the smoke. Sure. Those are in the core. Okay, those are in the core. And everything this way from the far horizon is part of the metal block. And we've been flirting with this idea, and I think you were on record the last time we talked to you, that there's potentially some core complex action here, mm -hmm. where this stuff that we're hiking in today and much of this in the foreground needs to go back. If it's a, truly a core complex, this is the upper plate. And if we go back in time earlier than 45 million years ago, the crystalline core is down deep and we're shoving this stuff back over. That's a, that's a departure from your cascade thing um, you just mentioned, but it just I, triggered that thought. I, I'm, I'm going to wave my hands a little bit because I need some geometry to show things. This is a perfect this place is, to do This is that. a good question, and I recall once showing a manuscript to Dave Brew for review and he said, on the Ross Lake Fault, which I worked on him for my dissertation, yeah. and which I understand, well, it's, it's in the view here, it's between us and Ruby Mountain, okay. and all the evidence is that presently the Ross Lake Fault is, is roughly a vertical structure. Yes. And Dave said, well, you're describing it like it's a core complex feature, how do you know it wasn't tilted from being a low angle normal fault up to be vertical? Ah. And my response was, Dave, you can't think that. Which is a fairly weak response. I mean, maybe it, maybe it was, <laughs> but I don't think that way. And, and I think if you were to ask me to explain the Cascades, I would say that here's the vertical Ross Lake fault. Yeah. Here's some sort of unknown core complex low angle detachment fault. Sure. And the core has come out from underneath from the southeast and slid along a, a vertical boundary that's the Ross Lake Fault Zone. From the southeast, you're oriented correctly right yes. now? Yes. Okay. And so my, my elbow is northwest of my hand. Sliding this is the Ross the Lake Zone, this vertical structure here. Got it. And the, the crystalline core has come out from underneath something to the southeast. And this is the Metau? The Metau is over here. So what's this? That's the Columbia Embayment. That's all that basalt out there covering up all of this. And if we have light still and we stop at the mouth of Navarre Cooley, <laughs> it's to look at candidates for the shattered, altered rocks you expect to find in this setting here on top of a detachment fault. Oh, that. But I haven't actually seen any of that geology. I can tell you that's indeed what happened. But that's my um, uh, too imaginative, too simple-minded understanding of what the North Cascades might be if we could see more. That's my wheelhouse. Simple. Like, unless we're forced to abandon it, I mean, it's fun to have those working thoughts. That is a good one. Holy cow. Now, 
when we get up to the Slate Peak Lookout, or we could walk back down there. Yeah. We could talk about a, a matching story that's got much smaller dimensions, but we're at the very northwest corner of a similar uh, unroofing fault. Okay. Where, where inside the metal, we see an upper plate that's metal and a lower plate that's metal coming apart like this. Within a detachment within the metal? Within the metal, a low angle normal fault. But it's not a big one. And it's putting recognizably volcanic rocks on top of recognizably volcanic and sedimentary oh, rocks. They're not metamorphosed. Oh. Um, but Robinson Mountain out there, we should look at later when we get more view, is including the hanging wall of a low angle normal fault that dips to the southeast. And um, there are beautiful high angle faults you can see down around the Lost River campground. We didn't talk about these way up. You look up on the hillsides, you can see steps where the Ventura volcanic contact is offset that are all down to the southeast, and they're the hanging wall disintegrating above this. So like if we're trying to visualize all this cool stuff going on earlier than the Eocene, we, we got to... Now this get, one is probably Eocene, this one here. Well, it's kind of oh, what okay, I'm saying. Yeah, these okay. de, if these detachments are all Eocene, basically, mm -hmm. and we're trying to go back earlier than that, we got to get all these things that slid back to where they were. We got to restore these and that's Turtle what, shells. enigma number three or enigma number four? Oh, I've lost track. I've lost <laughs> but it's track. One, one of the questions that Roland and I raised is, is how much Eocene extensional faulting is there in the North Cascades mm -hmm. we simply haven't recognized. Mm -hmm. I mean, we recognize that here on this um, detachment, which I don't think we even gave a name. I mean, it's the Monument Peak detachment. It looks like it's the roof, the Monument Peak Pluton, or it's intruded by the Pluton. And we recognize the big normal fault over by Glacier. But how many others are there? Well, when I hear a fault unrecognized, I think, oh, we didn't even bother putting a fault in. But another way to say a fault's unrecognized as a detachment fault is that you got a fault on a map, you got to call it something. So if the fault has had three different lives, mm -hmm. and it's a thrust fault for a while, and then it's a normal extensional detachment fault, what do you do on a map? How can you show two different actions on the same fault? You put triangles for the thrust history and little dashes for the detachment history. Oh, it's like you've done that already. Well, no, but we, we have a, a manual for how to decorate fault lines to tell you what their history is, okay. and it says do that. <laughs> um, oh, wow. This is a blast. Bill, I'm glad you're with us. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know how much you're catching with this. Some of the vocabulary is above my head, but I'm, I'm getting the thrust. You can get the, okay. you get, yeah, there you go. You're a quick study, Bill. So if uh, you need a picture of a dike. There's a little dike. Cute there's little dike. Vertical yeah, that's uh, an igneous rock cross-cutting the mudstone. Golden. Do that. You got a crack and lava squirts into it. Oh. And it probably happened at depth after the mud got turned into stone. Golden horn? Uh, it doesn't say golden horn, but it could be. Um, it looks vaguely basaltic. It does? Well, I'm... It's not a rhyolite. It's got dark phenocris. I have to get my hand lens out. Uh, it could have pyroxenes in it. I don't think it's got any quartz. Oh, you notice that these old faces have red in them. It mm -hmm. looks like oxidized iron, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the new uh, fracture faces yeah. don't? Yeah. Will, the, will these over time turn red too? Yeah. And will it take a long time? Well, it depends on what your time scale looks like. Well, In a geologic sense, oh, no, it's only a few thousand years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it'll take a while for this to oxidize. Probably. I, I, my guess is if Not you were to put, that would happen put one in your yard, it wouldn't look different next, next year the same. It's my guess. So thinking Ice Age, mm -hmm. beautiful U-shaped valley, uh -huh. alpine ice. Is, is the alpine story and the continental ice sheet two separate times in your mind? Are they merging or the alpine is late after the ice sheet is taken off? Is there any working published work on that or even your tentative thoughts? about the timing of this ice? We know on the west side of the range around Seattle, 
Okay. That the Alpine story is distinctly older than the continental age, the Cordilleran ice sheet story. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, we have dates from around Mount Rainier that show the Alpine ice is 22, 24, 26,000 years ago. Yeah. And we know that at Seattle, the maximum extent of the Cordilleran ice sheet was 15 and a half thousand years ago or 16,000 years ago. Okay. You know, almost 10,000 years younger. And we can go to actually um, I 90 east of Seattle, the South Fork of the Snoqualmie, and see that the, the, con the Cordilleran ice sheet in the Puget Lowland dammed the South Fork and built a lake in the mountain valley. And it's not at all clear that there was an ice sheet, uh, an alpine glacier coming in the other end. Huh. Um, there are the youngest advance up the icicle, the Rat Creek phase, it's got about the same age as, as the ice sheet in Puget Lowland. So there may have been a minor alpine glaciation, but not the most extensive. It was coeval with the Cordilleran ice sheet. And then in places uh, on Mount Baker and elsewhere, there are indications of a younger advance at 12, 13, or 14,000 years. That I just don't know much about that story. You know, get John Riedel to talk to you about it. Sure. Um, I just don't know that story much. But your instinct is to carry that chronology in Western Washington and getting into Central Washington and, and bring it into here, assuming that those advances are in sync, a, a continental yeah, ice? Yeah, well, that, that, that's what little evidence we have shows, I think. Mm -hmm. Here we can look at the landscape and see alpine glaciation mm -hmm. and see the continental glaciation. The last one w was younger. So th there is a sequence. How long between, we don't know. And I don't think, I have no hope of dating here the alpine <laughs> glaciation. <laughs> But if we go out to the edge of the ice sheet, that's yeah. been dated. Yeah. And Andrea Balbus has gotten ages for the Okanagan lobe that look like the Vashon lobe, Vashon ages, Puget lobe, of 15 and a half thousand years. 15 and a half extent. thousand. Withrow Moraine and down by Tenaino. Same yeah. Yeah. agreement there. Yeah. That's good. I didn't know that. Um, okay. Which is further interesting because it, with the Withrow Moraine and at Grand Coulee, and in the Chelan, the Columbia Trough at Chelan, the ice clearly advanced and retreated because of climatic factors. There's nothing else to appeal to. It, it, the world has to have gotten warmer or drier. Yes. Whereas in the Puget Lobe, in the Juan de Fuca Lobe, um, there's clear evidence that climate's not what's driving the retreat, the immediate retreat right there. Um, that if, if climate were driving the retreat, um, the Juan de Fuca Lobe and Puget Lobe would have retreated at the same time. Okay. And they clearly retreated in sequence, first the Juan de Fuca lobe, then the Puget lobe, closely spaced, but in sequence. And that begins to look like what drove retreat was rising sea level. It flowed to the tip of the Juan de Fuca lobe, oh, wow. it collapsed oh, and wow. cut off the ice for the southern Puget lobe. Oh, wow. Well, we didn't have that here, I don't no, think. <laughs> I don't think we had it here, but, but that's what makes it interesting to look at the bigger picture and yes. say, you know, to what extent, what synchronous with what, to tease out the, the role of climate and how big an effect seawater on a marine ice sheet might have. So the list is getting long for potential future study in this area. Ice age, bedrock, paleomag, also, you know, come on, man. Nick, you're talking to the wrong person about those kinds of questions. I went to school for more than 20 years so I could sit by the side of the road any place in the world and entertain myself looking at the road map. Yeah. I mean, my job is to look at this, at these rocks or this landscape and come up with questions and then figure out what kind of study to do that I might answer them. You know, of course the world's a fascinating place. How else could it not be? <laughs> well, I mean, obviously that's one hope here. We yeah. get younger folks watching some of these programs and going, okay, well, I guess there's work that could be done up here. I'm going to go yeah. find some professor yeah. to help support me, and I want to mm -hmm. go up and do this work. Yes. Good God. I have a question. Bill. Yeah. No. All right, I've got a request. Sure. So, Ralph, this is gorgeous. That's an understatement. You mentioned that there's sandstone over there, part of the Metau Ocean. Yeah. How much of what we see is part of this Metau Ocean, and where does the ocean fit into our grand scheme of colliding things with our margin? Ooh. Can we talk about questions I know the answers to? <laughs> um, 
everything we see this way, we, we, because of the haze and the peaks, we cannot see east of the Satan Fall this direction. Okay. okay. Oh, 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 oh. Everything this is still we see. Oh my God. And until we go over to the right of Robinson Mountain, those oh. peaks over there may be across the Satan Fault. But in this direction, everything we see is is west of the Satan Fault. Jeez. And in fact, the high peaks, the the, the background are mostly in the Monument Peak stock, which is a, a sibling to the Golden Horn Batholith. It's an Eocene no granite and granite diorite. But it intrudes into Metau, Cretaceous Metau sediments. Okay. And, and also early Cretaceous, maybe older, but Metau rocks. Okay. In this direction, um, I'm gonna make mistakes here. No, you're fine. Um, well, we don't have to do it. We can do it right here. The, the highest peak over there with snow on it is Jack Mountain. Okay. Well, that's Jack. And to the left of it is Crater. Yeah. And those are both in the Hosemean group. So those are in the Ross Lake zone. Um, and I... You're getting on your tiptoes now. <laughs> I, I can't... We, we may be able to see Hosemean Peak out there in the smoke, ah. but I can't recognize it. Not Hosemean. That's your old friend. Yeah. And, and I just don't recognize it from here. Sure. Um, but except for the furthest peaks that way, everything in this direction is also in the Metau Ocean with the exception or the qualification that many of the peaks are carved into younger plutons that intrude the metal rocks, okay. like the Satan Peak in here. Yeah. And I think we're probably seeing Castle Peak out there someplace at the okay. border that's also an Eocene pluton. So all of this stuff here we're looking at it is metal. And as far as we know, to get back to the collisional story, the, the metal rocks, some of them, and this is work that was done by, by Mark Cole and Lynn Tennyson back in the early and mid 70s. Um, they looked at paleocurrents in the Metau rocks. And work also done by Jim Trexler in the early 80s who looked at paleocurrents in, in the Virginian Ridge. Um, that the Hearts Pass and the Winthrop came from the east. And the lithologies, the compositions of the sandstones are, are consistent with a source in the Okanagan Range batholith. So they're coming from the east and feeding into an ocean to the west of there, which is the Metau, the Hearts Pass Ocean. And I should say, we're talking about the, the Albion right now and, and the Sunamanian. So the middle of the Cretaceous from 110 to 95 or so million years ago. And we see that we start at, a, at some time shortly after 110, the bottom drops out of the Metau. And, and we go from being shallow marine and terrestrial to being deep marine. We go from conglomerates and mudstones and things that have leaf fossils and things that have shell fossils that indicate wave action, beach deposits that are all mixed up coarse material, and we go then to uniform deep marine turbidites. Deep marine. Of the turbidite, of the Hearts Pass formation. So that happens um, in the early, late early or early middle Albion, uh, 108, 105 million years ago. Okay. The bottom drops out, and we think and this is mostly Mike McGroder's interpretation, we think that's happening because the crust is essentially a big springboard. We're putting a weight on the outer edge and depressing it. And that weight is the Hosemean Thrust Sheet, Jack Mountain and Crater Mountain, Hosemean Peak. And, and we're overthrusting, thickening, building up, and it sinks. And it, the crust is rigid enough that as it sinks, it sinks the stuff nearby it. We make a hole, the obvious sediment source is to the east in the Okanagan and fills this in. And as thrusting continues, it builds a, a pile out the west edge of the springboard of hosamine that's thick enough that it gets up into the waves and above the wave base in a terrestrial setting and begins generating a lot more sediment. And at that point, we see west-derived sediment in the basin. And Jack Mountain, there's a ridge to the right that's got lots of fine ribs in there. I believe that's Jaquita Ridge. Mm. And Jaquita Ridge is made up of turbidites of chert sand. Okay. And so I think they're a Hearts Pass-like sediment, Hearts Pass age, but derived from the west, from eroding Hosamine group. Well, when we say deep ocean, we don't mean Pacific Ocean deep, I don't think, right? We're, we're, the, because something to the west of the Hosamine is causing the thrusting coming this way. Yeah, by deep ocean, what I mean is I mean, the thing is, let's say deep, it's below wave base. Um, we're not seeing wave reworking of the sediments. Mm -hmm. It's um, deep enough that not enough light is getting through for things to live in the bottom, the muds, and, and chew the sediment up and mix it. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it's deep enough that shells tend to dissolve. We're at or near the, 
the, the, the carbonate compensation depth. Um, and that would help explain why we have a, such a hard time finding fossils in the Hearts Pass. Mm. Maybe. Mm. Um, but by deep ocean, I mean, you know, more than 100 or 200 meters. Right. Off the shelf and, you know, a slope basin or something like that. Well, we can cut this part if you want, but I want to repeat what I said to you driving up here, which is th this story of, of major thrusting and shallow and then suddenly marine and then shallow again, I guess, mm -hmm. is pretty familiar from the last video I did out in the peninsula with Mike, Eddie, and Aaron Donaghy, and they had Celestia 50 million years later accreting. We suddenly have, it feels like suddenly uh, things are deep and we have turbidites and everything else. I'm just wondering how much people have made uh, correlations or comparisons back and forth between Rangelia time and Celestia time with some of these uh, actions along the margin. I think that question of parallelism and similar things happening is a really good one. And to my knowledge, there's not been a lot of thought about exploring those. Wow. Um, but, you know, seamounts, oceanic plateaus get accreted. That does things. Yeah. And we should see it. We should see that happening over and over again in the geologic yeah. record. It's sort of delightful coincidence that if it has, it's twice in the same place in such short succession. Weird, right? Yeah, the North um, Cascades is like received trauma from two of these plateaus. And that to me doesn't seem quite so surprising because the North Cascades are clearly a place where the rocks are much traumatized. I mean, this is complicated geology. A lot of stuff happened. We don't know what it was, but a lot of stuff clearly happened. <laughs> oh, this is just great. Anything we get beyond this is gravy. Come on now, this is this oh. perfect. And you wanted to go where? We're not going to. We're not going to go there. I was thinking of going out to, this is Haystack Mountain here. Yeah. And the little bump just before there. Uh huh. Um, because those are both capped with volcanic rocks that are sitting on top of steeply dipping sediments. And, you know, it's time to full prop out here. Oh, yeah, I brought them. You want to draw? I, whatever, yeah. Yeah, if we had more time and we had fresher legs, maybe we'd bust out there and you wanted to grab a I wanted a to grab a sample. Um, but this is oh boy. my field sheet from 30 years ago. Hey. And we're at, we drove up the road to Hart's Pass and over the pass and up the road to the Slate Peak Trailhead, which is about here, end of the road. And we walked up the summit of Slate Peak and all throughout here, you can see the strike and dip symbols, 30, 38, 38, 46, 38, 44. These are all dipping off to the northeast at roughly 40, 45 degrees. Uh -huh. And we're capped by little tiny pieces. And this says sub midnight peak breccia, including oh, valley wall talus. At the time I went through here, I thought this might be midnight peak which is the mid-Cretaceous volcanic pile in here, one name for it. And Haystack Mountain itself is volcanics. You see the V in there. Mm. Um, since then, I've come to believe that some of these ridge-capping volcanic deposits that are clearly in pronounced angular unconformity on top of the Cretaceous right. are, are likely Eocene. Oh well, yeah, there's got to be a lot of time between the two, right? Well, enough to make a 45-degree angular unconformity. Right. And so I'm looking to at some point collect a sample which hopefully will have enough zircons in it that we can actually get an age of these rocks and find out if that is indeed eocene well, maybe we can s i'll send bill out there huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah huh now let's see did uh, you publish this stuff here no this this is published as part of the north cascades compilation okay okay good that's where this geology is out good. with it in, in for the world. I want to see if what I've got, got my Pesatans. This is the next quadrangle to the north. And okay, it doesn't go far enough to have my records over in here of the ridge crest with the erratic boulders of oh, tonal light on top. Yeah. Oh, thanks for bringing those. Shortening from southwest to northeast in the mid Cretaceous, and then extension and transtension southeast to northwest in the Eocene. So this is new to me because up till right now I thought that 
it was common for the detachment faults to be essentially those same faults that were thrusts before. Like if you have a new regime, why wouldn't you just use the fault that already exists as opposed to make a new de detachment fault that's cutting the thrust? Well, here in the Metau, the, the question's easy to answer. I won't okay. try elsewhere. Here in the Metau, the thrusts, the, the Chihuahuan thrust is a, a northwest, southeast trending feature that dips to the southwest. Okay. And is well situated for movement this way. If you want to tear things apart in this direction, it doesn't do you any good. I see. And, and the Devil's Peak detachment is cutting across it, mm. something like this, and extending, mm. extending the metal block from the southeast to the northwest. And then if you want to speculate, the Devil's Peak detachment is reasonably well, situ reasonably well situated to be a step over from the Ross Lake zone over to the Pesatan Fault. So I'm not even talking about Baja BC, there has been some rotation, some clockwise rotation of some of these structures. Does that raise your blood pressure to bring that up? Like all you're doing is working with these structures in their in their current orientation. Uh, How messy is it to bring it on? I, I mean, I. You may want to cut this. Yeah, <laughs> but. One of the things, one of the great ideas I had that I still think may be correct, but the last piece just never fell into place, okay. was if you go to the south and southwest here, over into that land of all those sharp, jagged peaks, okay. into the heart of the Ross Lake Let's zone, over here. to Elijah Ridge, yeah, okay. um, that keeps to going. the south end of the Golden Horn, yeah. um, basically in the Ross Lake zone, there is a, well, here in the Metau, um, the Eocene dikes, the Golden Horn dikes, mostly trend from the southwest to the northeast, mm -hmm. at right angles to the regional strike. Mm -hmm. In the Skagit core, in the Crystalline Rock, Northern Chelan block, pervasive lineations are at right angles to that. They're northeast to southwest. In the Ross Lake zone on Elijah Ridge and nearby, both the dikes and the lineations are rotated clockwise substantially. They are. And associated with that rotation, there are numerous east-west striking faults that are positioned appropriately for this sort of story. And the only problem is that predicts, since these dikes are fairly young and we think are golden horn offsets, right. offshoots, that the contact of the golden horn battle itself ought to be segmented by these faults. And where we can map the contact across these faults, it's not offset. And so I'm still stymied as to how to explain it all. Right. But there, there's a, 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 a obscure abstract that Bob Miller and I and Roland were party to many years ago about this rotation of lineations and the dikes in the Eli Elijah Ridge, Panther Creek vicinity that never went any further because we did more mapping and couldn't find the predicted offset of the Golden Horn contact. Well, it, I got to say that every time I, I hear of you know, compression from the southwest or or detachment northeast-southwest or whatever. I'm thinking of all the time that's elapsed, elapsed since that, since the time of that action and how meaningless or meaningful it is to have those discussions of these vectors coming in from certain directions. Yeah. I mean... Ultimately, I don't know how important it is. It's a commonplace that geology is palimpsest. We write one chapter on top of the preceding one. And if we're yeah. to understand it, we've got to understand the youngest, and then the next youngest, and the next youngest to get back to the older stuff. Oh, I can't believe we know anything at this point, seriously. Wow. Well, we've been working hard at this for, what, 250 years? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So maybe you're thinking we might find some pebble church on the road maybe going down? Or? Well, I know we can find them down below. We, we, we drive down through the base of the Virginia Ridge into the Hearts Pass. Okay. And then we come back up out of it in the Virginia Ridge again as we go down. On the road, yeah. And I want to look at my field sheet and see where the contact is here and if I denoted any gravels on the way down. Okay. Otherwise, we may stop in the woods down below, but okay. that's not as scenic. Nicer to stop up here. 
bring your tent. Maybe we should just camp here tonight. I very carefully did not do that. <laughs> All right. Well, viewers, um, if this place looks appealing to you, and who knows how long this haze will continue. Uh, I don't know, maybe in the next week or two this stuff will blow out of here, but even with the haze, it's a tough road, I'm not going to lie. Uh, but old Whitey made it with not a whole lot of problems. So if you've got a vehicle like this or, or more beefy, then please come up here, Slate Peak. I left uh, Ellensburg at 6 this morning, and we got up here by noon. We can stop the coffee. With a stop for coffee at Mazama store, for sure. This was your process, by the way. You'd have a, a, a topo base uh, in this kind of these kind of little rectangles. This is well, if you fold it up, these fit inside an official USGS Brown notebook. And they fit inside the vest of your Filson um, Cruiser's vest pocket. Now, you can't buy those Filson Cruiser's vests anymore. The USGS stopped issuing official USGS notebooks 20 years ago or right. more. And I prefer to let uh, Silicon Valley figure out where I am. And so my records are all in here. <laughs> you've, which, kept, you've kept up with the times. Which works very nicely, but it raises the question. This is an official government note and goes off the data repository when I retire in Denver. Where does that go? That's a good question. 